everybody. Merry Christmas. Let's all let's all rise and we will worship our great God together. This is you get to say Christ, Merry Christmas once a year. So today's the day. So let's raise our voices. Say one more time. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Can we just put that song on the rotation all year long? I mean, seriously, that is an awesome song. I love that. Um, thank you guys for joining us. Hello to everybody online. Please let us know that you're there. Uh, type something in, say a prayer request, whatever it is. Connect with us. Thank you for joining us. Um, thank you guys for being here tonight. We are here to celebrate Jesus Christ, the hope of the world. Applause. Yeah. No? Okay. We'll get to that. I'm just kidding. Uh, so yeah, uh, we just, um, 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 uh, we're thankful for your presence here. Just a few things as far as announcements goes. Um, uh, we are going to be having a candle uh, light at the end. And so for little ones, you'll be giving a glow stick. And uh, we think 10 and under uh, get the glow stick. Beyond that, um, uh, watch your kids with the candles. But uh, we'll be doing that as well. And um, um,
every one of you. I know that blesses the Lord's heart, and I know he's got a blessing for you because that's what his word says. And so thank you so much. I know we've had a lot of opportunities to give with Hope House and our, our friend from the other side of the globe. Mr. CC. <laughs> And uh, so there's been a lot of opportunities, and you guys have just been so generous. So we thank you. We just want to say thank you, thank you for that. If you still would like to give, we are not taking an offering, but there is a box in the back if you're here. If you're online, you can also give on the app or our website. So if you have a year-end uh, gift you would like to give, just remember it needs to be postmarked before the 31st. And... Um, we will end this year strong. So thank you so much. God bless you. There is also a, uh, for those of you with little kids, there is a, there is a, um, uh, like a rest stop in the back. If you do need to go back, we don't have child care tonight, but if there's, you know, for the, if the little ones need a little extra care, uh, you can go back there and minister to them. <laughs> uh, or it could be some older ones too. You never know, right? So um, just wanting you know that's available. And anyway, well, let's continue to worship the Lord and yes. thank you guys again. Yes.
Got, uh, got horns and stereo and everything, man. Wow, how fun is that? My goodness, whoa. What are you guys doing on Sunday? You guys doing anything Sunday? We're available. You're available? Yeah. All right, talk to uh, Josh. Let's see what we got. Take a separate offering for you. <laughs> Gas money, I don't know. Welcome, welcome. It's Christmas Eve. It's Christmas Eve. Yay, we're excited. Everyday Christmas. Range of emotions, right? The sense of... of like we made it through the year, we survived, but also a sense of anticipation, but also despair and struggle and, 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 and hardship. And um, it's, a, it's a, a time for us to look back 2,000 years ago, but look ahead as well. So let me open us in prayer. And um, I want to especially be mindful of folks today who have who have experienced loss, um, and we've all experienced loss in some way or another, but maybe it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a dinner a table, a, a, a chair tomorrow that's going to be empty, or, or maybe it's um, uh, someone that's in a hospital where, and they're struggling and family can't get there. I just want to be mindful of them. Um, many of you, you know, may, may or may not know that our brother uh, 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 Brad Nelson went to go be with Jesus uh, early this morning, and so... We want to keep them in prayer and um, um, Arisa's parents in San Diego as well. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, this, this, this day that we celebrate and we celebrate your birth every day. Jesus, be glorified, be magnified. And would you, would you comfort those in need this evening, those that, that need a special touch from you? It's what you do, God. You do over. Uh, beyond what what uh, anything or anyone else can do, or uh, so would you minister to people uh, as we celebrate today? There are some Lord that are they're struggling, and we pray that you would lift them up, O oh God, and encourage them, and lift up their eyes to the hill where their help comes from, because our help comes from you, O oh Lord. So we celebrate you, Lord, be glorified, be magnified, and exalted in all things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Oh, 
Amen. Thank you, Ginsu Parisi. <laughs> you can ask him why I call him Ginsu. If you didn't get a candle, we have one for you. Make sure you get one. <clears throat> this was written by a historian named Durant, not Kevin, regarding the... Um, the season of Christmas 2,000 years ago. This is what he said. The lusty peninsula was worn out with 20 years of civil war. Its farms had been neglected. Its towns had been sacked or besieged. Much of its wealth had been stolen or destroyed. Administration and protection had broken down. Robbers made every street unsafe at night. Highwaymen roamed the roads kidnapped travelers and sold them into slavery. Trade diminished, investment stood still, interest rates soared, property values fell. Morals, which had been loosened by riches and luxury, had not been improved by destitution and chaos. For few conditions are more demoralizing than poverty that comes after wealth. Rome was full of men who had lost their economic footing and their moral stability. Soldiers who had tasted adventure and had learned to kill. Citizens who had seen their savings consumed in the taxes and inflation of war and waited vacuously for some returning tide to life, uh, to, uh, to life them back to affluence. Women dizzy with freedom, multiplying divorces, abortions, and adulteries. The story of Christmas begins in darkness. There was the darkness of oppression as they were being oppressed by the Roman Empire, the Jewish people were. There was the darkness of persecution where simply because of their race and their religion, they were significantly persecuted and had very little rights. And there was the darkness of disillusionment. Anything that they could have done to get out from under the yoke of the Romans, they would have done. Some believed the only way to win this fight was to fight. And they found out in 70 A.D., when Titus A.D. stormed Jerusalem, that that wasn't going to work either. Habakkuk, years before, 2,000 years ago, in the Old Testament minor prophet, speaks about another dark time. 
And he asks God some questions, some very real questions. And he says this, he says, Oh Lord, Habakkuk 1 verse 2, Oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you not hear? Even cry out to you violence and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore perverse judgment proceeds. Yes, on that first Christmas night, there was hopelessness. Maybe there were some who were looking forward to the Messiah. Maybe they were thinking things can't possibly get any worse than they already are. Maybe, just maybe, the Messiah is going to come. Well, as it was then, so it is now, in a different context. We live in a world that is filled with darkness. Darkness is the absence of light. The Bible calls living without the precepts and promises of God and without Christ in your life is to live in darkness regardless of the artificial light or the light of the sun that might surround you. COVID-19. There really isn't much more to say beyond that. Wars, rumors of wars, hunger, unemployment, uh, businesses that we have always seen going out of business or in bankruptcy. One in six restaurants are closed. 100 million Americans out of work. I read recently that some Nevada economists got together and had a think tank and they said that it might take upwards of two years for the Nevada economy to return to what it was pre-COVID-19. Two years. Racism, division on every level, loneliness. We prayed already for those who were shut in. And we've seen the devastation that's happened with economic lockdowns that have caused uh, domestic violence to increase, suicide, alcoholism, drug addiction, as people feel trapped inside their own homes. Mistrust of the government. Monday this week was the winter solstice, and it's the longest, darkest night of the year. I didn't know that. I, I knew there was a bright spot in that, but I don't have to tell any of you about the darkness that surrounds us. Many of you at one season of life or another have experienced that, and like Habakkuk, maybe you cried out, God, how long? When is this going to end? Lord, I need you to show up. I need you to do something. In one form or another, darkness touches all of us, doesn't it? <clears throat> you might say, like the old poet, that you are acquainted with the night. We don't gather tonight to naively deny the existence of darkness in our nation, in our world, and even in our own heart. We don't, we don't uh, deny that. You know, the Bible doesn't give you a pep talk uh, or an argument that things aren't really bad. What I love about the Word of God and its description of people is it is blatantly honest. And that almost sounds like, of course it is, it's the Bible. But it tells the truth about the men and the women in the Bible, and it tells the truth about the darkness that's in the world, that will always be in the world, at least for now. So it affirms that darkness, but also it does something else. It affirms that there's light at the end of the tunnel. We're going to go backwards tonight and we're going to read a familiar passage in the context because when you read the Bible, context is everything. You talk to people sometimes and they take one bit of scripture and they take it and they say, see, this is what this says, but they don't take it in context. And so it's important that we know this context. Um, uh, we're in Isaiah chapter 8, if you want to turn there in your mobile device or your Bible, if you have that. Isaiah chapter 8, um, and in, in this, in this uh, story, we're going, to read, we're going to read some names. Some names are very profound. Now, in, in, in ancient days, names meant a lot. It, uh, uh, parents would, would, some would even seek the Lord, and they would almost 
uh, speak prophetically over their sons and daughters and give them a name that, that they believed would, would mean something later. We, we don't so much do that now. Like, uh, uh, I don't think there's anybody here or online with the name Mookie. That's no, there's no prophetic <laughs> reference to that unless you're a baseball player or something <laughs> like that. I don't know. Mookie. Um, uh, names don't quite, you know, so when I was teaching school, the, 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 the kids said, you know, if you have any more children, you should name, like, if you have another son, you should name him Jack. I'm like, no, uh-uh, no, that's not, that's, that's not going to work. My kids, I don't, I, I, my kids, I, I kid you not, had a, had a, uh, 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 pediatrician, and his name was Dr. Weiner. I thought that was awesome. Anybody here take your kids to Dr. Weiner? <laughs> yeah, no whining allowed, no? No, that doesn't work for you? Yeah. <laughs> that was great. But in the old days, names meant something. And so um, uh, Isaiah is going to announce that he's, uh, 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 he and his wife, his, his virgin bride, they're going to have a child, and he's going to be a son, and he calls out his name, and he calls him Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Everybody say Maher Shalal Hashbaz. I know you think that's some guy in the NBA, but it's not, right? That's, this is... This name means quick to the plunder and quick to the spoil. And, and about two years after this child was born, the, the northern kingdom, Assyria, had already conquered Syria, uh, and, and they're on their way to invade the north of Israel. And so he encourages people. He, he calls his name, uh, the, the name of his son, quick to plunder, quick to spoil, because because there's an enemy that's coming, and he encourages the people. So, so he, he speaks to a people who are listening with his ears, with their ears, the word of the Lord saying, the, the enemy is coming. And so the implication, that's future tense, and so the implication is, is that you need to seek the Lord. There are times of great darkness that are coming, and he's prophetically speaking the word of the Lord, and he, he, and he warns them because they're not listening to him, and he says... And when they say to you, that is people who say they know what time it is or what's going on in Israel, he goes, when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter, should not uh, a people seek their God? He goes, don't listen to them when they're telling you to seek the dead. Or he goes on and says, should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? Uh, and he gives this, 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 this banner, he says, to the law and to the testimony. And, and I love that. It's like a, it's a proclamation. No, don't go to all these talking heads. To the law. Go to the Word of God. Go to the testimony. He cries out to the people. And he speaks of those others' voices and says, if they do not speak according to this Word, it is because there is no light in them. They will pass through it hard-pressed and hungry. This is what going to happen to the people should they listen to these so-called prophets or these soothsayers or magicians and sorcerers, he says, is that they're going to pass through it hard-pressed and hungry, and, and, and it shall happen when they are hungry, they will be enraged and curse their king and their God and look upward. Then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness and gloom and anguish, and they will be driven into darkness." Powerful, powerful words. With everything, every fiber of his being, he's, he's telling them this is what's coming. And he encourages them to seek the Lord. They would not. And he says, they will be driven into darkness. That's despair. But then we go to verse nine, uh, chapter 9. And it's like, the, he, and in the midst of that darkness, he, he, he speaks life, and he speaks, and this is the word of the Lord. This is God speaking through him. In, in chapter 9, verse 1, he says, nevertheless, nevertheless, and I wonder if the people who were listening and paying attention to the word of Isaiah went, yes, yes, don't, don't stop the prophecy there. What's next? He goes, nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. As when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, 
and afterward more heavenly oppressed her. By the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. Uh, this is, this is that no, the northern area of Israel. Verse 2 says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. And he goes on to speak about the great things that are coming to the nation of Israel, which I believe these things haven't happened yet, if you want to read on, verse 3 through 8. So the northern regions of the promised land around the Sea of Galilee were, were severely beaten by the Assyrians. They were the first point of attack. And this promise is to that land once seemingly lightly esteemed by the Lord. And he says, to them, those who have walked in darkness in this great depression of time, they will see a great light. That's what he says will happen. And then, and then he, then he, and again, because God is outside of time, God speaks to, speaks about something past uh, that has a, 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 a relevance in my life today that has an impact in my future. God does that. Uh, he does that all the time in His Word, and, and Isaiah is, 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 is speaking this way. We're, we're celebrating something that happened. I keep pointing over there. I mean, we said, isn't this awesome, by the way? Don't you guys love this? Yes, applause, applause, yes. <laughs> Whoa, man. He, he's, he's pointing back to, today we, we celebrate something that happened 2,000 years ago that has, a, that has a, a relevance in my life today and determines the way I live my life tomorrow. And so I can look through all the, sco the scopes of all of those dimensions. So, he, so Isaiah fast forwards and he talks about a child. Remember that he calls his son Maher Shalal Hashbaz, but now he's going to talk about another son that is not his son because this can't be an earthly son because of the descriptions and the names that this son will have. And so he's speaking to the promises of God being fulfilled in this place of darkness. And he says, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, a son is given. And this is not an ordinary son because it says, And the government will be upon his shoulder. All the governments, all the kings, all the queens, the monarchies, all of the, the governmental structures one day will all be on the shoulders of this child who was born, the son who was given. It will be on his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Father of eternity is what that means, Prince of Peace. Whoa, okay, okay, this is not an ordinary child. It's not. And it says, of the increase of his government. So it's an expanding government, if, if you would. And, uh, and peace. So the increase of, he is the Prince of Peace. The increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So this is, a, this is a king whose reign will never end, ever. And he says, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with, with judgment and justice from that time forward. And what does that word say? Forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Whoa, what a promise. This is a familiar Christmas uh, scripture, right? You guys, are, you guys have read this. Now you know the context. It was spoken in the context of a great darkness that was coming and a light that would shine in the midst of that. Well, Isaiah has another son, and he calls him Shehar Jashub. Everybody say, everybody say Shehar Jashub. No, no, Jashub. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like, I said that right. <laughs> um, and it means a remnant shall return. So you're telling us that there's going to be this invasion, this darkness, and, and we're going to be taken captive is what happens. But, but then you're naming your son that a remnant will return. Okay, so there's, there's hope in that, right? That, that's a shift. 
That's a change. He, there, 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 will, there will be some light in this, right? When Assyria was conquered, um, the northern portion of Israel, when, uh, uh, th- th- that nation was never restored. Um, it, it, it was restored, but it was what, what we know as Samaria. But when Judah was taken captive, uh, they had a, and then returned, they had a n- another chance to establish themselves. And so in the New Testament, and this is one of the, we'll get to this attribute of God that, that is amazing to me all the time. It's just amazing. I'm, I'm ne- it never ceases to amaze me. Well, so we go, from, we go from chapter 9, verse 1, that speaks about what's, what's going to take place in this land. A- and then we get, we get to Matthew chapter 4, and we get the full picture of, of what happened. Um, Matthew quotes this passage as fulfilled in the Galilean ministry of Jesus. That's where the majority of his ministry took place. It was in the northern area of Israel around the Sea of Galilee. And, and so, so Matthew says that scripture was fulfilled in Jesus coming to that area, that lightly esteemed area. That was the special blessing. It says in Matthew 4.12, Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, okay, the fulfillment of what uh, was spoken uh, hundreds of years ago, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, Beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's it. That's it. That's, so what? we celebrate the light of Christ. We celebrate the birth of Christ. We celebrate the light of the world coming uh, and, and illuminating the darkness and what a dark time it was during that season. Um, and, and, and there's a fulfillment of something that was promised to the prophet Isaiah. What does that tell you? What does it tell me? It tells me that, that our God is sovereign and he's in control. Uh, he, our, he is still in control. I mean, he, he and we're going to see this again on Sunday. We've been studying the book of, of, of Joshua on Sunday, and, and over and over again, we see these attributes. We, we see this attribute of God where he just so makes everything work together according to his purposes and his plans. And he says, yeah, well, Isaiah, you're going to say this, and there's going to be an enemy who's going to come, and then they're going to return to this land. It won't be what they think it is, but they're going to return to this land, and there's going to be a light that shines, and it'll be the light of the world, Jesus. And he is so in control. And you know what else that tells me? It tells me that light shines in the darkness. If there's darkness someplace on our planet, spiritual darkness, it's because the light of Jesus hasn't been shown in that place by someone being incarnational and someone who is the light of the world being there. The same God who said, let there be light, still shines his light in dark places today. I know it because he shined his light in my heart. We were having a conversation, Jesse, you were there at my house the other day, last week, Monday, or whenever it was, and we're, we're sitting around, you know, eating some chips and salsa. Oh, oh. Miss Paws, oh, salsa. <laughs> And Richie, yeah, Richie, yeah. Richie made some salsa too. Man, we had salsa for days. And guys started talking about, you know, I don't know, uh, Brother Billy was with us, Billy Rush, and started sharing his testimony. And it just, it just, it just, if you've never heard Billy, Billy's testimony, there is no plausible explanation for him being alive, nor being the man that he is but God. And our brother Jesse started sharing his testimony and just, and, and I, I just look and I thought, 
man, I could not imagine this young man terrorizing his mother. I just couldn't imagine it. I don't want to tell your testimony, but I'll let you tell it one day, brother. He goes, yeah, man, it was so bad. I go, Are you kidding? really? Uh, that, what happened, though? The light of Jesus Christ shined in his heart. Hmm. Light gives hope, no matter the darkness that surrounds you. If you have light, you have hope. The darkest night of the year, Saturn and Jupiter aligned and made the, the imprint, or it looked like this massive light, and it wasn't massive, but it was a brilliant star in our galaxy, right? And I just thought, wow, the darkest day of the year, and God shines the light. It was, just, it was just beautiful. And it turns out that light is not just a concept. It's not just a philosophy. And there are people who have claimed to bring illumination to this world, but no one ever claimed to be light. <laughs> it's one thing to say, my words are light. It's another thing to say, I am light. John 8, verse 11, and Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Let me give you the backdrop of that. Jesus has a conversation with a woman who was caught in adultery, and they're picking up stones to stone her. And Jesus, the light of the world, is illuminating that light. And he says something to her that set her free. He said, woman, where are your accusers? And she said, I have none. And he goes, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Verse 12 says, then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So light is a person. That's what we celebrate today. We celebrate the light of Christ, the light of the world. So you too are lights, because when you have Christ in your heart, he illuminates his light. Matthew 5, 14 says, you are the light of the world. A city is set on a hill, that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. 1 Timothy 4.10 says, We have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people. We celebrate that today, Jesus, the light of the world, who comes to illuminate the darkness. If you uh, do not have your candle, we are going to, um, in a moment, as the worship team makes your way up, or worship. We have uh, a couple more songs for you, and um, we'll light our candles, and then we will celebrate together. Guys, you can begin to light those candles maybe about halfway through the song. Start lighting about halfway through the song. Take me back to eight years old, little church on a dead end road, with a candle flicker in one hand and death's hand in the other. Take me back to silent night, my heart was full and the world was bright, cause right now the world looks nothing like those innocent December. This day peace on earth is hard to find. And I need you to remind me one more time You're still the hope of Christmas You're still the light when the world looks dark You're still the hope of Christmas You're 
The snowflake falling down like a blanket on this town. For a moment, we can hardly speak. With him, the brothers made us seek, find healing touch. May hatred find be one with love. And may every heart take room for you, the one who came to save us. You're still the She slip her tiny hand in mine, and we both talked to you. It took me back to eight years old, my daddy's hand and the story told about heaven's love and manger love and promise that's still true. You're still the hope of Christmas. You're still the light when the world looks dark. You're still the Everybody wave your hand. I know you want to applaud. You can't with a candle in your hand. <laughs> well, it's always special to meet on Christmas Eve and to light the candles. To symbolic of Jesus, the light of the world. If you have light, you have hope. I don't know if you've ever been to the Mammoth Caves in Utah and went down and into the cave and at first it's fun and sometimes the rocks are really wet and you have to be real careful no matter what but it's fun and it's like oh yeah and then it gets dark and then it gets darker and then it gets darker then it gets uncomfortable because you get disoriented disorientated it's hard to know you know you, you're, you're watching every step you're, you're watching what's around you and and you know the thing about it is at some point the darkness is so dark, it just seems like it just envelops you. And maybe that's what hell is sort of like. Maybe it's this place of incredible darkness, among other things that the Bible says about it. But you know, the interesting thing about that is that darkness can't overcome light. But light overcomes darkness. Because the smallest match in the darkest depths or the darkest cave and been in some depths and you've been in some caves, the, the smallest spark can illuminate that entire darkness. So Jesus comes and he lives and he, and he brings illumination, he brings the, the light of God's word to us and we celebrate that today. We celebrate Jesus, the light of the world. John chapter 1 says the light has come into the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Jesus said he came to those who were his own, but his own did not receive him. But to all who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. And that is our hope. Amen. And I pray that our Lord would grant you the peace and hope of believing this Christmas as you trust in him. And Father, we just 
thank you, God, that not even the darkness can snuff out your light. You are truly the hope of the world and the hope of our life. Thank you for coming to save us. Thank you for the promise that you are coming again. We love you, Lord, and we praise your name. I pray, God, a blessing upon each and every one here, each and every one listening online as well. Lord, that this Christmas we would know the joy of your hope in our hearts. In Jesus' name.
Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, everybody, wave your hands. Yay. It's hard to clap with a candle in your hand. Yay. Uh, you know, put that, can you put that chorus back up? He has come for us, Lord Jesus. How's that going? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, no, not that one. Keep going. Keep going. Lord Jesus. Yeah, he has come. Yeah, yeah. He has, he has come for me, the Messiah, born to give me life. See, it's one thing to point to something two years ago that's a historical fact and to think maybe some good things came out of it. Yeah. But it's a whole other thing to say, no, no, he did that for me. For me. It's, it's, it's God so loved the world, which is huh, everyone who's ever lived and ever will live, that's globally, that whosoever believe, that's me. So God speaks to the world, and yet he loves the individual. But not first, but in the last of life. So Father, we thank you for tonight. Uh, I would say you're awesome, but that really kind of pales. It's not, I mean, you're, you're beyond awesome. You're God. Jesus, we celebrate you. Help us to shine light in the darkness. You are the answer to every social ill we have. Help us to be your light. We love you. We thank you. I pray your traveling mercies upon everyone here. Set your angels about our vehicles. Get us home safely. We have a safe time together till we join again on Sunday. We love you. We thank you for all things. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. amen. And Merry Christmas. God bless you guys. <laughs>